yeah so we'll just sort of get going cool. and start chatting sounds good uh my plan is that loads of people are going to listen to this not just climbers not just strong men like i want it to be like wide reaching yeah so sort of briefly but as not briefly as you want like what what do you do yeah well, i had the un- very unusual job of being i guess what some call a professional rock climber um <laughs> <laughs> i guess i use the term professional very loosely um because i think i i make a living out of going climbing and you know just get paid by big you know climbing brands to to go and do that sort of stuff but i also do like coaching and a bit of root setting which is putting the holds on the walls and uh you know so i i guess like my i make a living out of the climbing industry um, yeah but i guess like what i'm pretty well known for these days is uh going and you know putting up big wall climbs first ascents um you know climbing all around the world from you know the us to madagascar to patagonia and it's a lot here in scotland as well yeah that's really cool it's I've been really fortunate that like everyone I've spoke to when they've explained what they do are like it's sort of a job it's like professional strongman it's like I get to do my hobby and make a living from it and it's the best thing uh, when you say like big wall climbing what again like a wide ranging audience mm. what to you constitutes like big wall versus multi pitch yeah. say Okay, so uh, big wall climbing, I would sort of put in when you're spending multiple days going, you know, up on a big climb uh, in a sort of like big mountainous area. So you're spending, you're actually sleeping on the wall, you know, you're getting up in the morning, you have your breakfast, you're climbing. You may have a portal ledge. It's like a ledge that you you set up so you can sleep on it. Like when a hanging the, tent. Like sort a hanging of thing. tent when the when the wall's so sheer that there is no ledges for you to sleep on so you have to drag this thing up behind you but you literally do everything up there you know so you're you're eating you're also going to the toilet up there so you have to have a, like you know a little bag where you keep all your all the you, stuff that comes poop. up all your poop your exactly poop tube. yeah the poop tube um you know so yeah that that's big wall climbing um and uh but I also you know i also do other things like uh i guess like you know single pitch climbing where it's it's only just like one pitch of climbing, but very, very difficult. Yeah. Traditional climbing and sport climbing, sport obviously being bolted and safe, but very hard. Traditional climbing, which is, you know, what we both enjoy a lot of, which is placing your own protection, which is much more balancing, you know, that risk side yeah, of things. Yeah, like it can be safe. <clears throat> yeah. Like, I think the thing where people get a bit weirded out with climbing is, it can be as safe or as dangerous almost as you want it to be. Yeah, yeah. Like, you could go out and climb V-diffs. Like, I've had days where I've just gone out climbing V-diffs or soloing V-diffs, and you're like, this is just brilliant. Like, you're just out in nature, like, walk, <coughs> like going for a walk, but it's a bit more up. Yeah. Or you can do gnarly trad. Yeah. And... It can be very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Or technically really hard. Mm. Or both, which yeah. is always a trip and a bit wild to watch. Yeah. Like someone do something super dangerous and it's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> like, but I think, I think it's interesting because like, I think to a lot of non-climbers or potentially people who are relatively inexperienced climbers or just climbers who do something slightly different, they might look at something like traditional climbing where we're placing their own gear and they, they look at it and think that looks very dangerous. You guys are crazy. Or you guys, you know, you guys must be so brave. Or adrenaline junkies. Or adrenaline junkies, which I think is always so funny because that is quite the opposite. Like, yeah. I, I, I don't know many climbers who are adrenaline junkies who, who know, who you know are out there looking to do the most dangerous thing and to have that experience just to get a hit. It's not about that. It's, it's kind of like a, a challenge, and I guess it's overcoming the challenge. Nobody wants to put themselves in danger. Nobody wants to fall off. But it's it's learning to, I guess, assess assess the risk yeah. using your experience and your skills and, and using your skill set to be able to climb that successfully. And it's kind of 
figuring out where that line is and not crossing that line because as soon as you cross the line that's when you are in serious danger that's when you do hurt yourself yeah um, and I typically you find that most climbers they they don't tend to they have the you know injuries in climbing when they you know when they cross that line are so few and far between it's generally the inexperienced climbers that hurt themselves because they don't know how to you know figure out where that line is yeah it's um the thing that i mean people who aren't climbers like a lot of people have seen like free solo mm. and honald saying like the consequence is potentially high mm. but the risk is relatively low like yeah. you try and make it as safe as possible yeah and then you make the decision of is it worth going for do you find it like meditative do you where are you mentally before you go and do something sort of gnarly do you, do you mean like do i do i have to get myself into sort of like a zone or something or? just what <clears throat> say you're stood at the bottom of like an e9 trad route mm. fairly hard but you know you can climb it what is your process before you start yeah. up a route so i think um I always like before I set off if I'm trying something really hard where the consequences are high I always like to to know that I can do it so I'll you know I'll set I'll, I'll practice a climb beforehand I'll figure out the gear I'll make sure that I'm you know confident I know where the, you know where the point of no return is where if I fall off it's going to be dangerous and if it, if it is going to be dangerous what the best way to climb that is and so that's like my my sort of like before I start climbing, before I attempt a lead, I'll I'll put that put that um, I'll do, I'll do all that sort of stuff. So you're like a head point climber. Well, that and I'm not no I'm not just that. I also do on site climbing. Yeah. But that's something completely different altogether. It's almost a almost a different sport. <coughs> like yeah. So I guess we got we got we got There's there's two different types of climbing here now. It's quite getting quite confusing for the people who aren't climbers. <laughs> So there's a, the type of climbing where you can practice a climb beforehand and the type of climbing that you, you don't practice climb beforehand and you just do gr what we call ground up on site with no previous knowledge of the route. With those climbs, the grade is a lot lower, like the difficulty is a lot lower. Yeah. So you, you, you learn how to do that purely by just doing lots and lots of climbing well below your limit and slowly building up, building that experience, building that knowledge of how to place gear, um, how to read the rock, and all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, that's a completely different set of skills to head pointing a route, which is when you throw a rope over the top, abseil in, try the moves, you know, in a safe environment before you then go for the lead. Yeah. And so, I mean, I did like a, a route the other day there called Sky Wall up in Sky. Um, <laughs> it's like a E7, E8, pretty bold in places. Um, and before I went on it, I practiced the moves, made sure I knew what, how, to, how to climb it perfectly checked the gear made sure i was happy with the gear and when i went for the climb there was obviously nerves beforehand there's always nerves i always have nerves um i'm always there's always a bit of like i don't know what it is like it's uncertainty yeah i feel like i feel like it's a feeling that every climber has but no one really knows how to explain what it is yeah it's just like a ooh. yeah like because to me it's, it's that noise like yeah. ooh it's different to it's different to when you're practicing the moves because this is this is the this is the exam you know yeah you put in your you've you've, you've done all your uh, studying <laughs> now is the final test now let's see if your studying has you know is, if it's going to you know pay its due and you're going to actually succeed and uh i think it's a lot of it is confidence in your ability to place the gear and to climb well and uh and I guess just that, yeah, that that confidence coming through in what should hopefully be a good good climb performance. I think other people who do things at any sort of like in any sort of performance uh, sport or activity, whether it's strongman strongman competitions or an, another like sport, tennis or badminton, you know, competitions, they'll they'll know that same feeling. You know, you've put the training in. Now you've got to perform. Yeah. And I've come from a competitive background. I came from competition climbing in the early days of my climbing career. And although it's a different feeling, it's it's on the same sort of uh, level, you know? Yeah, you've got like 
is it <coughs> four minutes? Or? Well, in a climbing competition, you, there's a time limit. You're also competing against other people. When you're outside and you've got a really hard, bold climb to, to do, there's all the time in the world, sometimes, I mean, obviously weather dependent, yeah. but like, there's all the time in the world. You don't have to do it that day. You can come back another day. But I guess the thing is, you, you always know that, you know, it, it's always going to be there. And, uh, but there is like a, there's a feeling that you kind of want to get it done. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you're, when you're there, it's like, right, do I tie in and go for the lead now? And when you tie in for the lead, it's always different to when you're working it because that is, as I said, the final test. And so you commit, you pull on the wall and then you commit to the route. And when I, when I commit, um, I don't know that I think like the, the feeling, there's a lot of in, internal, you know, monologue, like, it depends on the type of climb if it's a, a short punchy climb which is requires just like action then there'll be less monologue but on sky wall it's a slab let not overhanging at all and um, the holds you're holding onto are very small just like you know barely like half a half a pad sometimes even smaller you're just kind of like teetering up the wall very slowly sometimes you can actually take both your hands off the wall and, and rest but you're in a position where down climbing is absolutely impossible so you really are at the point of no return and you could be run out from your last piece of gear quite a long way but you've got a lot of time there to think about what's going on <laughs> it's like, it's like the worst <coughs> mix of super dangerous but also sort of safe like so, yeah, exactly. you can get both hands off you can yeah. but spending 20 minutes stood there with no hands you still stood there yeah right? exactly so you can get a physical rest but you're still psychologically yeah so that's where the it. that's where the confidence and experience comes in you know knowing how long you can stay there knowing kind of how to get your head your mind in the right frame of i know how to get your head in the right frame of mind to to just engage with the climbing commit to it and uh and and just and just get through it and uh and yeah for me at last last week when I did it it went all it went smoothly and it was all good yeah do you have like <clears throat> a is there a point of no return in terms of like once you've tied in are you then going for the route or will you still you know could you tie in stand there get ready chalk up and then just think no nah, it's not right yeah definitely and I think it's important that any climber is able to to do that and make that decision in fact you know me and me and my friend last week we identified one pot in the climb where it was actually pretty good gear before the really hard bit and if we felt like we weren't really committed we could back off there yeah. so we actually had that conversation beforehand we're like right this point here you know it's just before the hard bit if, you, if you're not feeling it just just call it there you know yeah and i think <clears throat> it's so easy not just in climbing but sport life sort of everything that you can feel a bit not overwhelmed but maybe over committed but knowing that there is plan b whether it's if i get to this point there's something i could ab off or you could down climb or if you go beyond that point that's it like you're on the wall yeah understanding the situation and being happy to go like in climbing like being alive is more important yeah. than trying this move when it's not there it's such a massive thing to be happy with doing yeah and at the end of the day like <coughs> nobody wants to hurt themselves nobody wants to die um it's supposed to be fun you know yeah. we're in climbing because we enjoy it it's a great thing to do it's a great way to be outside and i think like everyone finds things everyone finds a little bit different out of climbing like enjoys things a little bit differently but you know i really like the challenge aspect i think a lot of people love the challenge and that sort of pushing your mental barriers pushing your physical barriers and um, seeing kind of what you're capable of but you do need to have you know a reality check sometimes be like is this the right moment for this climb and you know just being able to to call it a day you know when it's just not feeling right yeah uh, i've i've had that before you know um it wasn't i didn't i didn't call it a day but you know new statesman 
Which was... Uh, new Statesman in, in Yorkshire, uh, John Dunroo. Yes, E9. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is a really famous, uh, kind of quite old school climb. So put... did Ryan Pascal do the second descent of it? Is that... I am not sure. I don't know. Yeah, anyway. Anyway, <laughs> this climb... Um, the down in uh, down in Yorkshire. I remember the day I, I did that, and uh, I was having real problems getting through the bottom section. It's a quite a hard bouldery section, and then once you get through it, you then just have to decide to commit for this next bit, which is super bold, super scary. A fall there is just not really something you will, anyone wants to do. Um, and uh, I remember getting to that point and actually bailing. And then just what just saying i just i just needed to walk away and uh it was quite early in my trad climbing career and i actually phoned my old coach to chat to him about it because yeah. i was like <clears throat> i actually went for a walk and i phoned my old coach and i was like uh you know what do you think you know should i should i go for it shouldn't i go for it and he was like you know he basically said to me he's like you know no one's going to make that decision for you but you just got to remember that it's not going anywhere and you don't have to do it today and something about him saying that made me feel a lot better I was just like, you're right. I don't have to do it today. There's no, you know, it's, there's no pressure. And then I let's listen to some music. And music always, music's really important to me. It always kind of gets me in the right frame of mind. And uh, and I just kind of, I kind of just felt good again. Yeah. And then I went back to it, pulled on, and got to that same place and just felt so different. And I know that if, <clears throat> I know that if I had just committed, almost like just kind of like pushing through the barrier the first time round, I would have been in such a bad headspace that the likelihood of me uh, being able to initiate the moves in the right way in the right body positions would have been you know, far less likely because you, you need to have confidence in yourself uh, to be able to do those moves. Yeah. If you don't feel confident, you, you hold back a little, you don't push as hard, you, you try and over grip and all these things they make the climbing m- harder and more you more likely to fall off. Yeah, because some climbing is like there's some stuff that is just sort of belief based. Mm-hmm. Like I remember uh, being on <coughs> Seamstress Slab um, in the slate quarries, working a line on that, and go right. I need a foothold, and you're on the slate, and there's just one little ripple and you're like well that's it that is the foothold and you just have to stand on it with a hundred percent tried to move did it came down just like on a top rope just playing about and then I was totally distracted next time I tried it and you're like oh I'll just put my foot on it you just ping straight off and it's like you do you think you've done everything right but by having that bit of distraction or not quite being in the right headspace like moves just won't work yeah and it doesn't make any sense yeah and it is fine when it's a a top rope or if it's a sport climb where the consequences are pretty low um but when it's like a trad climb or it's a really bold climb and the, the consequences are pretty severe you know you need to you just need to have that ability to take yourself away and be like no like Let's not today not today or not right now and I did that that time and it worked to, it worked in my favour it was good another time it didn't work in my favour <clears throat> was in Northumberland when again it was quite early in my trad climbing career and I uh, wanted to do this slab climb called Peak Technique and I just approached it the way I approach sport climbs and I just like you know just head first just kind of just uh, trying to get up the thing you know and I took one fall and I the gear held and I didn't look to check if the gear had changed position Ooh. and then I went up again I, and again again if you look at there's a video of me online doing it if you look at my body position my body position is total is terrible because I just I'm not confident at all but I'm I'm approaching it with the wrong attitude and I'm just just trying to get up it took another fall all the gear ripped out and I landed on my back um, from probably like 10 meter high Ooh. really lucky I didn't break my back and totally paralyze myself watching the fall it is so savage um, it just looks terrible it looks like I could have died um, but Jeez. I was yeah. really lucky it took me 
a few years actually to build the sort of confidence to go back and try it again but I knew I always knew that it was something I had to do and I, so I went, break that barrier break down break that and... barrier down yeah exactly I went back and I did it and it's still one of the proudest achievements of my climbing career and the, the, the funny thing about it is <coughs> the day I went to do it I was with a friend of mine Adam and he belayed me on it and I was when I topped out I was standing at the top and I was screaming and I was yelling I was like whoa my god like this is amazing I'm so excited this and Adam wasn't planning on doing it and he went oh I'll have a quick top rope on it and see what it's like see so the top rope on it tried the moves and uh, he was like I'll give it a lead he, he led it and he was just like that was nice <laughs> and it was just so funny because like for me it was such a big deal because I had overcome this like fear and the grade is E6 and it's not like it, it does get a sense but not very many but it's not like it's not like you know doing El Cap it's not like doing New Statesman in terms of like you know getting like articles written about it or being some epic thing it's just just this climb in Northumberland that I kind of had had a bad experience on when I was younger and wanted to do yeah but because it was breaking through that barrier it felt like a, it felt like the world to me you know and for, for Adam he didn't have that baggage so he didn't so feel, he just climbed <clears throat> just climbed it and just yeah enjoyed climbing yeah. rather than yeah. having that big and, and you know what it, do you know how long the climb takes you basically it probably takes you like 20 seconds to get onto this ledge from the ground you place the gear again which probably takes a couple of minutes to place the gear you stand on the ledge and it's probably five meters of climbing above the gear on this slab um, which again takes probably the best part of 20 seconds it sounds pretty eh? so it sounds like a cool route it's a really cool route it's something that on a top rope you should go and do because it's like not yeah. that hard it's just like padding up a slab but because the consequences are quite high on it it just it's so engaging and it it just it's the epitome of a climb that you know it's it's easy when it's safe but when it's not it feels like the living end yeah it's sort of <coughs> pure head game pure rather head game than techie climbing exactly yeah yeah so you said you start did you start climbing in competitions as in like did you get into climbing <coughs> indoors and like was competition the natural route for you to yeah go? well like I mean, indoor climbing was... In it, living in the city of Edinburgh, there's not really much rock climbing around about. Um, indoor climbing walls... There was a few in Edinburgh. There was a couple in Edinburgh at the time. Um, and, yeah, I just got introduced to indoor climbing and absolutely fell in love with it. As a, as a kid in, a, in the city at school, you know, comp, climbing competitions were the natural thing to gravitate to. It's, it's you know, competitive. There's other kids. Um, you get into, you know, training... If you're a good climber, basically, you, you kind of just get, like, not forced, but you kind of get, like, pushed towards competitions. Yeah. I just think it's, I, th I think it just think it's natural in the cities when there's no access to outdoor climbing or if you don't have, like, a mentor who takes you outdoor, climb, outdoor climbing. I was lucky. I, I had uh, a mentor who was, on top of being, like, a coach for competitions, also was a very keen outdoor climber so took me outdoor climbing as well oh cool yeah and i had uh, two parents who although they weren't climbers at all uh, were very uh, supportive of me and when they went on holiday they said you know we can go somewhere where there's some climbing so when well, my first outdoor Sorry. my first outdoor trip climbing was to kalimnos no way with my mum and dad <laughs> yeah and That's like, like a proper <clears throat> for those who don't know that on the up there of like european mecca climbing destination like yeah that's Columbus. where you want to go yeah it's like the perfect balance of kind of like holiday you know beach you know sand fun you know sea stuff but also gnarly hard rock climbing big caves stalactites like really fun style of climbing and it's all pretty safe as well um, and yeah. so it was really it all sport all sport yeah all sport climbing bolted um, and uh, yeah it was an amazing place I was like very thankful for my mum and my dad uh, for allowing give me an opportunity to go and experience that because I hadn't really experienced outdoor climbing that I enjoyed back in the UK when I was like 15 16 years old because it was all trad climbing and at the time trad climbing just seemed like just seemed boring and a bit like slow paced yeah. and uh, you know I was quite like a hyperactive you know possibly ADHD like wired little you know, yeah, kid. spending five minutes 
trying to wiggle in an RP naught is yeah and 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 I also like the climb the trad climbing around Edinburgh is all like uh, in these quarries and it's what you've experienced Rathal Quarry yeah which you know it's funny like you've experienced Rathal Quarry it's good quarry isn't it it's it's genuinely like really good climbing yeah it's great climbing but as a youngster I just thought it was boring whereas yeah. Kalimnos is amazing it's steep it's overhanging there's these big stalactites and blobs and things um, anyway that was an amazing experience it got me into outdoor climbing my coach from back in Edinburgh um, I had a couple of coaches who mentors who were amazing and they took me sport climbing around the UK and introduced me to trad climbing slowly over the years and then I kind of got the bug for that eventually and kind of like yeah I think once I I mean now, now I'm a bit of like an, an all-rounder I just like love everything I actually still love indoor climbing I love indoor climbing I love training I love the community of indoor climbing walls I love sport climbing but I absolutely love trad climbing I love adventure I love yeah. exploring and that's kind of where I'm at now in my in my career is that um, you know I went through a big phase where I traveled a lot around the world and you know went climbing places like Madagascar and Patagonia putting up big wall first ascents uh, but these days I'm actually more inspired honestly by what I have on my doorstep because Covid is a big part of that like us being locked down for so long and yeah. then being forced to kind of look at what we have but Jesus the UK has a lot of good climbing like more geological diversity than pretty much anywhere I've ever been and uh, Scotland is like the most vast untapped resource for climbing on all fronts whether it's bouldering sport climbing trad climbing winter climbing there's just endless endless rock and mountains and crags and sea cliffs and boulders to go at that you know it's just it's actually it's kind of bonkers and it's still it's just funny i, I say all this stuff but still nobody will nobody can really be bothered to go and do it or there's very few people that can be bothered absolutely mad like yeah. i went to I want to say it's Dingwall or something. It's like a big... Yeah, like, Dingwall and Inverness. Yeah, Scottish yeah. conglomerate crag. Moy. Is it Moy? Yeah. Something like that. And it's it's basically pebbles that are naturally concreted together. Yeah. And like the guidebook was like, it's not worth visiting. <laughs> Great guidebook. Like the holds, <laughs> holds break off. It's just like total, just some dog shit crag. Yeah. And I walked up. And like you're looking over it's not a lock but it's the i can't remember exactly where it is one of the rivers <clears throat> the road's down below and you can't hear it because you're up in the trees and there's this absolutely gorgeous like crag and it's made out of in all fairness to the guidebook fairly shit rock mm. but you just no one like there's no chalk on any holds like it clearly hasn't been climbed for ages and you just think there's definitely climbers up here mm. like why aren't people looking at what's local and like you've been fairly prolific in your bridge climbing and <laughs> urban bouldering yeah which on one level is like good for youtube it's good for that social media side but it also seems that you just genuinely enjoy climbing and yeah dicking about i flipping love climbing and that's like the that's basically the cinch of it all, you know. Um, you know, the, the bridge stuff, which I did, <clears throat> if people aren't really aware of, I, I basically um, did a bunch of bridge climbing uh, over a lockdown because living in Edinburgh and having the five mile radius, we didn't really have access to anything else. Um, so, I, or we did have access to one other crag, but it was rubbish. <laughs> so, I, I was kind of my, my, my sort of like a thirst for exploration and adventure took me to these bridges. And I, I totally, I don't want to say pioneered, but I kind of want to do say pioneered at the same time <laughs> because I, I kind of did start this trend of people basically around the world looking for bridges now to climb because these turns out there's these cracks that are great for climbing on. Yeah. And it's kind of it, it inspired like people like Pete Whitaker and Tom Randall to go and explore more stuff um, as well. And they've kind of like done loads of stuff down south now. And so it's, it's quite cool. But again, like, Bridge climbing's not my thing. Climbing's my thing. Yeah. And if it's bridge climbing, that's cool. But I flipping love going outdoor climbing and rock, you know, all over Scotland and the UK. And I love trad climbing, I love bouldering. I love, I kind of just love it all. I just, I'm just a climber. Yeah, and if, it's so clear. Like, through 
was talking to someone yet they're asking like where I'm heading and as I, I've sort of known <coughs> known of you for a while sort of half known you through social media and it's like just a pure climber yeah <laughs> like there's no like no asterisks there's no like I'm a climber but I only do this yeah or like I only like bouldering but if it's 10 feet high and this angle and this like you just are very clearly a climber yeah in any sense like which is cool to see because I think people seem to be sort of categorising themselves a bit more <coughs> or like only doing this or mainly doing like comp style bouldering or doing this and is really refreshing to talk to someone who just loves climbing yeah I mean I totally respect people that uh, specialise as well and I think you know, being a specialist you can get to such a high level of whatever it is you're doing um, but for me personally the way my mind just the way I'm my makeup my, way my mind works I am I have a very short attention span uh, and I'm quite hyperactive and I just love going climbing and I think I kind of get motivated by whatever anybody's doing around me um, and I'll definitely go through waves of, of psych and energy towards one particular thing and then I'll change within like a month or even less than that you know pretty soon after yeah it is hard for me to kind of like <clears throat> focus on one thing which I'm finding at the moment like I've got a project I want to do up north I know that I need to put the training in which is going to mean I can't do this stuff that I kind of want to do so I'm trying to like I, I do have to sometimes just hold myself back from yeah. you know from just doing everything but it is it's is quite nice it means it means that you know it's life's never boring there's always there's always uh, like a something new different. adventure yeah, a new way to yeah totally so when you because you've been on some mad trips like some mm. climbed in some amazing places would you go let's uh like pick madagascar for example were you there for a reason or were you just going exploring if there's rock there like well we know there's rock there because <coughs> it's like the future and you can look on the internet yeah at exactly what's there but did you have a goal in mind or were you just going to madagascar for a period of time well the whole madagascar trip uh, came about because when i was a kid i came across this book called parois de legendes by arnaud petit and he wrote this kind of parois de legend literally means legendary walls in french ah. and he wrote this guidebook uh, on these legendary walls all across the planet and in one page there was a picture of this mega wall in madagascar big black granite rock that I was just totally inspired by and so you know when I was quite young I looked at that I always wanted to go there and I think I was just thinking of somewhere to somewhere I think one year I was thinking like you know where, where can I go this year and it just popped into my head you know Madagascar and so I looked at the wall that was in this picture and I thought it'd be really nice to do a first ascent there because doing a first ascent it's kind of like it's just it's just pioneering something new you know it's like going where nobody's been before this is ex, you know, it kind of satisfies the, ex, the my sort of uh, hunger for adventure and exploration. Um, but at the same time, I also wanted it to be challenging and hard. Although I like doing easy climbs as well, I really like doing hard climbs. I really yep. like being pushed. Uh, I like being pushed physically, technically, mentally. And so my plan for Madagascar was to go there, find an unclimbed line or an unclimbed face and try and get from the bottom to the top free climbing the entire way so that is um without you know using a rope and uh, quick draws and everything using gear as well but you know it's to keep you safe rather to keep than me to safe help you rather than to help up. me so I, I essentially from the bottom to the top i climbed just using my fingers and my feet and and got to the top uh, i ended up finding this amazing line which so it turns out in that place called Saranoro in Madagascar there had actually been quite a lot of development over the last 20-30 years yeah. and uh, a lot of the king lines the ones that looked really good had actually been done but there was this one which I saw kind of like weaving its way be 
between these two massive black streaks coming down the wall that looked like a NASCAR race car driver had just like driven up the wall oh, and left the skid marks. Massive burnout. Up yeah, the exactly. Wall. Um, and I just was totally inspired by this line. I was like, I want to go up there. So uh, nice. yeah, we just started climbing uh, over. I think it was over like five days. We bolted it, um, getting from bottom to top, and then over. I think it was two or three days. We free climbed it after that. So were you? Did you? A bit to no, bolt just it, or ground did you up, bolt? ground up, yeah. No so you basically, I had a drill on one side, had a wee bag of bolts on the other, and I would just climb, and I had a sky hook attached to a, a sling on my harness, and I would just climb up, trying to find like the way to go, and then when I would, when I was happy, I would hook like a little edge, sit on it. The thing with the, the sky hook is, you sit on this little edge, and you can hear the creaking off the rock, and the sort of snapping off like little little edges that I've never nothing's ever held them before and then as you as a cracking stops you know that the hook has like and the rock has accepted your hook and your weight and it's solid and so you just sit there you're like right i can i can chill now you know that if that breaks you're going to go for a ride but kind of kind of once it once it sort of settles you, you know you're fine so it's either going to break <clears throat> really quick yeah I kind of ex- right. that's kind of what i suspected i never <laughs> i'd actually never done anything like that before at the time um but then i kind of like I, eventually i came to realize that's how it kind of worked and then you kind of like get your bolt out then you get your drill out you decide where you want to drill you drill it then you take your bolt out and then you hammer the bolt in and then you clip to the bolt and then you sit down and then you go whoo the sky hook <laughs> didn't break it was all good and then just run it out re- again and- yeah just repeat yeah that's fucking gnarly man were yeah. you sleeping on the wall as you were both like ground up yeah yeah we hauled a portal ledge and a and a small uh haul bag up with food and and all the sort of stuff yeah a lot of uh, freeze-dried meals and we just like slept on the wall as we went up yeah that's awesome yeah that's super cool yeah it was amazing and uh, i think madagascar it was uh you know there's no rain so we just had a a portal ledge and like we stole a, a bed sheet from the from the place from our base camp. There was this like little little like kind of like uh, Malagasy huts where we had as, which we had as our base camp in the tiny little village. So we just stole some bed sheets and we just like clipped them on and to hide from the sun. We were like hiding under the bed sheets. That's so cool, man. Yeah. So I mean, Madagascar sounds amazing. You've obviously done a lot of climbing in the states. Um, and stuff in the Dolomites as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Where's the like? Not necessarily the best place you've been, but you know when you're just like, Jesus, I'm like out there. Mm. If you like, where's the most? Like the gnarliest place you've been? Not necessarily like your favourite, but like somewhere yeah. you've thought, like, why am I here? Um. Well, it's kind of it's kind of a funny one, like you know, like places like uh, like Yosemite, you know, you're so close to civilization, you know, like 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 places like Yosemite or anywhere in the Alps, really, you're just so close to 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 to, to anyone. You can get off a wall generally pretty quickly. There's mountain rescue there to help you if you need it. Um, although there's you know objective dangers and hazards, um, I think if you put the right steps in place. You're kind of not. You're never far away from help. Okay. Um, so they always. It always feels like you know it's okay. Um, there's a place in uh, Patagonia I went to called Cochamo, um, in Chile, and that place is like a four or five hour trek to get to, you know, the base camp area, and then you know another two three hours to get to your climb, and you know there's no mountain rescue there. Um, although again it is like a popular place and there are other climbers there you know you there's no helicopter rescue if you hurt yourself if you break a leg if you if anything happens you've got to get out like you've got to get you've got to try out. and get yourself out or your friend or who, your partners do you know i saw an accident that happened there and uh it took you know 15 hours uh, and all and every climber from like the, the base camp area was like collected to come and like save this person. So that was epic. But I was actually in Madagascar when I when we were free climbing um, our first attempt at free climbing the route that we just bolted. My friend Alan took a bad fall, broke his leg in three places, literally, literally two hundred feet up on the wall, 
and uh, and I had to rescue him. I had to, I had to uh, basically get him down to the ground safely whilst he was like crying and like sobbing in my shoulder and his leg was like dangling off like open fracture bone sticking out oh that's yeah fairly awful. pretty awful and then i realized just that was a, i guess one of the first times i realized just how you know dangerous it is being in these places where there is no first world medical care where there's no mountain rescue because the only the only support he got was me getting him down some first aid from me and Ali, the Ali, the filmmaker we had with us, and then the, the villagers who came up with a with a, a really janky uh, sort of stretcher, um, and uh, we kind of like bandaged up his leg and got him in a splint made out of our made out of like a rope protector and some sticks we found and some and our, his harness that we chopped up. Jeez. So and then and then when we got to the hospital, literally like eight or. 10 hours or something like later the hospital just wasn't like set up to deal with him and you there was no one there who was um able to provide morphine or any any sort of uh you know you know like good pain relief good pain relief yeah none so he went for pro- he you know he went for another another 12 hours after we got to the hospital with no pain relief on an open fracture uh, wound the you know the day after we got him uh flown to la reunion on a private plane basically to get him seen by first world medical care because la reunion was a french colony and uh and they had like a hospital there so he basically went there and, and got seen to and he spent like i think he spent like six weeks there god yeah he got the surgery done there by the same guy that operated on uh, alain robert yeah, uh, or the same guy that operates on like Elaine Robert every time he has an accident. <laughs> Elaine Robert is a guy who's like Spider Man, yeah, who climbs the climbs buildings. buildings but and... He's had he's fallen off a lot of stuff and had a lot of bad injuries, and apparently the surgeon for Elaine Robert works out of La Reunion. <laughs> Just the same, so he's like, oh, another climber. Yeah, like so he knew, another... he knew exactly. He went, in fact, oh, in fact, Elaine had the same injury, so I can sort you out. <laughs> we'll just do that again. Yeah, exactly. So what's um, it's really weird because I, I just love climbing. <laughs> and sort of part of me is like you're doing a podcast you should ask like informational big stuff but part of me is like what's El Cap like because oh, yeah. it looks it looks pretty amazing beautiful it's like a piece of rock yeah is it it's all granite yeah it's water worn <clears throat> granite or yeah. glacial Glac- glacial glacial worn granite there's two so that you know Yosemite is split up into two sides of the valley really you've got um, you know, you've got sort of the El Cap You've got half dome down there but opposite el cap there's i think it's uh upper and middle cathedral and the rock i've never i've never climbed high on those walls but i've climbed along the base and the rock there is like way worse quality than yeah. on, the, on the el cap and you can and apparently that's just not glacial worn and el cap is el cap is like bullet hard solid rock and um, any gear placement and any crack in el cap is bomber will like literally haul up a truck it's yeah. so solid it's so i mean climbing on el cap in the most part is pretty freaking safe um if you're following like the good crack lines yeah and um, you can it's also so steep so um you know it, anywhere past like the quarter mark climbing on el cap quarter height you know you're climbing like steep overhanging vertical sections of face with no features below you so if you take a massive fall generally just in just, space ah, a massive bungee jump it's just like it's just great fun and i was speaking to tommy caldwell who's literally probably the best climber on el cap he's put up the dawn wall and he told me he's never had a bad fall on el cap he no. just always falls into space and he's done the gnarliest stuff on there he's done some mad stuff yeah because uh <clears throat> You look at like the Owl Cap guide, and it's like first aid climbed probably Royal Robbins or Warren Harding. Yeah. And then it's like free climb Tommy Caldwell. Yeah. Free climb Tommy Caldwell. He just sort of went, I'm gonna do everything. Yeah. And then there's, well, it was the uh, wall of the early morning light, then dawn wall. Yeah. And then the dawn wall, like, if people should just watch it even if you're not climbers that's sort of an amazing film and story about seven or eight years of just suffering for a climb (laughs) like pure 
like proper obsession. Yeah. What What did you do on Owl Cup? Uh, so I've done three. I've, I've I've done like three free climbs. So I've done the first one I did was El Nino with Jacob Cook back in two thousand and sixteen. The second uh, route I did was Premier, uh, and the third route I did was. Oh, oh no, the sec- second one was Golden Gate, third one was Premier. And then I tried a couple of years ago, I tried a route called Magic Mushroom, which is a Tommy Caldo route. Yeah. And it's funny, like, I I heard of Magic Mushroom and I thought, that sounds like a really good route. For no other reason than I like the name, Magic <laughs> Mushroom. I was like, that sounds great. <laughs> but then when I, I was climbing with Tommy Caldwell uh, in Germany as part of, like, a sponsored thing, because we're both sponsored by the same companies and uh he was chatting about magic mushroom and saying it was the best route he'd ever done and that was after the dawn wall oh like, wow he'd done the dawn wall he was like nah magic mushroom is the most beautiful route i've ever done and i was just I was like flipping yes i was like i want to go back to e70 i want to do a route another route and that one sounds good i didn't really know how hard it was until i actually got there and looked at a topple i hadn't even bothered looking at a topple before <laughs> i left uh, and then I realized someone mentioned to me in the house I was staying at that it was supposed to be like the second hardest route on El Cap after the Dawn Wall. And I looked at the grades and it was just like 513, 513, 514, 514, 514, 513, 513. Like so many hard, hard, hard pitches so of climbing. So it's not like a hard pitch. No. It's a hard From like wall. the second you leave the ground, it's engaging. And like from halfway to the top it's relentless like yeah. there's more hard climbing in the last half of magic mushroom than on any other whole climb on the entirety of el cap bar the dawn wall like no way i was looking so i was i was i was looking at uh i was looking at other routes on el cap and typically They've got like lots of five twelve climbing. If I other pitches, lots of maybe lot, lots of five twelve climbing. A couple of five thirteen, you know, pitches, whatever. Maybe a hard hard five thirteen pitch. Maybe one five fourteen if it's like a really hard pitch. But uh, Magic Mushroom has multiple five fourteen pitches, like a dozen five thirteen pitches, um, you know, and and some of them are bold and some of them are uh, are are safe, but all of them are hard. And the climbing style is so different to anything I'd ever been on before. It's all sorts of weird corners and very intricate, very intense climbing that is just very technical. Yeah, like full body, full positional. Body. Full body. Like my ankles were so sore after that trip because you're constantly smearing like this on like surfaces. Like just your, your, your ankles just feel like they're just being like worked to the next level. So, for people who don't know, the majority of what you've done or is known for is free climbing. But Al Cap and Yosemite, in America anyway, were like the home of aid climbing in the 50s. Mm. Did you do any of the old aid routes or um, have you ever aid climbed no, I mean like aid- properly with big air quotes? Yeah, so aid climbing, hard aid climbing is probably the thing I'm not really interested in doing. I will aid climb a route to be to sort of test out to see if it's free climbable. So when I was yeah. in Patagonia, when we were trying to ground up uh, a new route there, we basically aid climbed up sections uh, and then we would, uh, if they were really hard, and then we would try and free climb them afterwards. Okay. Um, but like hard aid climbing, it's not f- you can't free climb it. Like it's that's the point of it. It's yeah. like it's so hard and there's no features that free climbing is just absolutely out the question. Um, so, you know, I I mean I think I think aid climbing is just it's kind of what we were saying earlier before we started talking. You know how we, we were saying like you know a lot of disciplines in climbing are like one end of a spectrum. Yeah, I feel like aid climbing is like another again another it's branch. like a line off it's a rather line off. Than... yeah it feels like that it feels like you know the people that are really into aid climbing might not even be into any other type of climbing they're just like yeah like i met i met this guy 
on top of El Cap after I had summited another another one of the free climbs and he was an A climber and he was just like this big heavy metal guy with like mega long hair and he wore like a Van Halen t-shirt and I was like whoa this guy could have he looks like he's a hell's angels you know like not really a climber and he had a, had a harness on with all his gear and I went hey man like what did you just do and he just went I just topped out this like gnarly A5 A5 climb and he had a huge belly and he just looked like he'd been tanking the beers probably maybe I should get into aid climbing <laughs> yeah. it sounds like a, a calling but. yeah it was funny and it was just it's just you just see like a very different group of people but they're super cool and they're super psyched for for, for what it is you and know, it's for aid climbing. fully mental yeah it can be it can yeah, be very like, very 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 dangerous um, cause, but yeah. who was uh, like Andy Kirkpatrick oh, doing yeah. um what route is it? It's sort of left of the Cyclops' eye on our cap. Uh, is it? I, I do. Is it Pacific something? Reticent wall. Oh, the reticent wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Reading about him climbing that, and it's like, yeah, it took like a three hundred foot fall because mm. on a skyhook held. It's like, no, no, that's not all right. Yeah. <laughs> like, freak, put some gear in, bolt it, do something. Yeah. <laughs> what? Well, um, Different type of challenge. Yeah, and seeing like Jim Bridwell tripping on acid hammering copper heads in mm. you're like you are not all right no like, you are in a different place to get like wrong out like shredded doing like gnarly little moves and then it's like i'm just gonna hammer this bit of copper not even into a crack yeah like, onto a crack yeah i'll stand on that, that yeah might be all right <laughs> no well actually so the you know sometimes uh so typically the aid climbs get done and uh, maybe over time, you know, with mo more and more people aid climbing them, you know, hammering in pegs and things like that, sometimes it opens the cracks to being able to free climb them. Yeah. Uh, and Magic Mushroom is one of those routes, actually. So Magic Mushroom was an aid line, and then Tommy Caldwell freed it. And of course, like, not, he didn't free every section, so he ended up, like, climbing around parts of the, the existing aid route. So yeah. they don't follow necessarily the same line all the way. But at the very end, there's an A5 pitch. The A5 is pretty much as high as it goes in air climbing. But there's an A5 pitch that right at the very end, and I asked Tommy about it, and he went, ah, oh, don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And I got there, <clears throat> and basically, it was an 8A uh, layback. So that's really freaking hard. And the only protection was a blown out copper head. Like a you know, copper yeah. head, one of those things that you, you smash into the edge. And it, there was one blown out one, one that someone had obviously fallen on and it had failed. And one above it that looked a bit better, but still had the the bit for putting the carabiner into. And I looked at it and I just like, I have to now commit to 8A climbing, but this is my protection. And if I take a fall and it rips, I'm flying down the wall. At this point in the wall, things had slabbed out a bit more and there was a ledge and I just didn't want to take that fall. Yeah, because the top of our cap sort of like a, it's weird like a dish shape it's like a dome it just yeah. kind of domes out um, and it was getting it was getting to that point and the, cli the climbing trying to think of the opposite of a dish and yeah like, dome dome yeah <laughs> but um, yeah so I, I kind of got to that section and then there's like a there was a bolt that had been placed really in a really bad position it's about another three meters above but it's to get to there you had to actually do hard climbing to get there and I, I didn't know any other way to do it, so I fashioned a grappling hook out of carabiners. <laughs> um, and using the rope, I've got some footage off that, using the rope, I was like throwing the grappling hook, trying to catch the bolt. <laughs> and uh, after about maybe an hour of attempts, I eventually got it. And so I didn't have to commit to that horrible, uh, yeah, there's, horrible um, layback. I can't remember what route it is, <clears throat> but Johnny's got one that's like... I think it's like VS7A or something. It's like some wild grade he made up in the yeah. 80s. And it's like, how does this... It's like, no, you have to, like, lasso a spike, but it's over there. So you're literally, like, swinging the rope round, chuck a load of slack up, then it's totally safe. Yeah. But it's like, nah, that's where the gear is. Like, somehow you've got to get to it. Yeah. It's quite cool, that off-the-wall thinking, that that's how you that's how you make it safe like so many people only johnny would like come up with something like that so many people would, wouldn't think like that they'd just be yeah. like oh i guess you're just going to climb some really bold terrain to get to that <laughs> so, point so now nah, just chuck a rope over chuck there. a rope over it yeah what um 
what else did you do? Did you do much else in Yosemite Valley itself? Or? Yeah, yeah, like um, did like lots of single pitch climbs. As I said to you earlier, like I went up to Tuolumne Meadows, climbed like the really famous uh, 13D 8B sport climb called Peace. It's like a classic. Um, in Yosemite Valley, I did um, a very famous corner uh, called Book of Hate. Yeah. It gets more sense these days, but when I did it, not that many a sense really. Um, Hazel Finlay like fame I think she's got a picture of her on it um, and yeah like just did like lots of sort of like stuff on the valley Astro Man which is like a super classic but I guess like my main my main thing with Yosemite was going up on the big walls and that's kind of why I went there yeah I really I really want to go back I was maybe thinking of going back next year um, but I think if I I want to go back for Magic Mushroom but I think if I go back next year i think i i might just go and do a lot of uh a lot of like other climbs just try and get mileage because i'm i'm training for triangle towers in in the summer and i just really want to be climbing well on granite and not projecting anything yeah that's going to be a fucking wild trip as well yeah yeah it's like a kind of two we've, we've had that on the, the cards for so long and uh, you know obviously when covid happened we had to postpone it and then we could have gone this year but i kind of still felt it was a bit like still a bit too soon after covid and with restrictions and things and i felt i just feel like it didn't feel right so i, yeah. I postponed it again to next year um but uh i, I really want to go i really want to do a first ascent in the himalayas and uh, yeah i mean that's just such an incredible play like it's on my list like everyone goes like oh, i want to go up everest mm. so yeah that doesn't it's just not interesting to any climbers I know. Yeah, like, it feels so like weird. I think Everest is one of these things that I think to to normal people they see it as the highest mountain in the world and therefore it's an achievement. But to climbers, I guess this is another reason like why you know climbers are thinking so differently because Everest is not a climb anymore. Everest no. is like a is a fixed rope with guides who basically drag you up there, uh, and you either get up uh, or you don't. Um, but there's not really much in the way of technical challenge surrounding yeah. Everest, and I think that's why it just doesn't interest most climbers. Because um, providing the weather's good and you're physically capable, if you're going, you know, base camp or the normal, it's hard to say normal because it is still Everest, but yeah. the tourist route up, you can almost guarantee. 80 90 percent of the people you're with will get to the top yeah i've absolutely no idea I, the thing is I, I just know so little about it because i'm just not interested there is a gorgeous slab on one side of it though. is there yeah it's like it's six thousand meters so it's a bit deathy oh really but it's stunning i've well, also been looking at the ogre oh really it's like to me in my head i'm like it's climbable and then part of me goes like you've been climbing a year you're like way overweight for a climber what is wrong with you and then i'll be flicking through a book and i'm like it's pretty it's like this because they the route of the ogre takes the erect yeah but there's like a 75 80 degree slab on the side of the erect yeah and it looks fucking <clears throat> stunning well that's cool I, I think like a lot of people uh miss these things because they're so ingrained into taking the most obvious looking like way up but there's actually turns out there's actually really good climbing on a lot of these big mountains yeah uh, and in these really obscure places I, I years and years and years ago when i first started climbing one of the instructors at the wall won a trip to bol go bouldering in the himalayas and he was literally Whoa. bouldering with like everest and k2 and all these places like around them and there was apparently the bouldering in the valley is just nuts like that, um, but nobody talks about it nobody goes and does it it's just like i know that guy called pill who um i can't remember what company his dad used to own back in the 80s he yeah. was like a clamberis like yeah 80s clamberis climber <clears throat> sleeping in the public toilets his dad owned like it wasn't dmm it was a massive company though yeah and he was just like dreadlocks full hippie like yeah sleeping in the toilets near uh, the lake in Clamberis. yeah yeah and i know a guy who knew him really well and he's just disappeared to the himalayas goes bouldering every day he's yeah like, it's the best place in the world yeah like there's no people you just 
there's loads of rock because it's the whole place is made <coughs> of rock. Mm-hmm. It's like it's the wildest place to go climbing. Yeah. No one goes climbing there. Yeah. I think if I was going to go and if I was going to do an, another trip to Himalaya, it's not the triangle one, but I think I would genuinely take a bunch of bouldering pads, some bolts, some trad gear, and just go and see what we could like do out there. You know, just go and play. Have a yeah, have a playful climbing trip just along the along the valleys. Go and explore. There's still, I mean, this other thing is there's still so many valleys in in that part of the world where nobody's ever been. I mean, they've got. I mean, there's valleys in Scotland where no one's ever been. I know. I know. So. I know, but this, this is the thing. To think is, like the Himalayas is gonna have, <clears throat> yeah, like it's it's twenty tw- like it's twenty twenty one. Like you can see almost every inch of the world on the internet. Yeah, and there's still unexplored places. Like we found places in the peak that people haven't climbed. Yeah, like there's just so it's like guidebooks are great, but also maybe close it sometimes. And yeah, walk in that direction climb some rock yeah totally I'm always getting told off because I never bring guidebooks anymore because and and uh, <laughs> it, it's not good because sometimes I get on things and I'm just like what is this or like how many pictures is this or like what is, <laughs> is this supposed to be some gear and you're like well it bloody says in the guidebook <laughs> I'm just like oh right okay maybe I should have brought the guidebook along but um, it does it does make it nice because then you end up just looking at things and thinking that looks nice that looks like a good bit of rock maybe we should climb that instead of just looking for the line that's already been done yeah and you're climbing because you want to climb it not mm. because you're getting the tick or yeah <clears throat> what so what's the plan with Trango are you going new routing or yeah well originally the originally the plan was to go and repeat this really famous climb called Eternal Flame that was originally climbed uh, almost free by Wolfgang Gulich, Kurt Albert, who were total legends of the 80s and 90s. Um, <clears throat> but then uh, I think like origin- the original plan was to go and do that. And then as I realized how much of a, it's a bit of a sad thing to say, but it's become a bit of a trade route with people that just want to climb it fast and kind of like just pull on gear and get to the top. And uh, someone told me when I was in Yosemite that actually it just gets loads of a sense with just people doing that, and that if we were actually trying to project it, it might, it might actually be a bit annoying, you know, uh, having all these people. Wow, that's yeah, a bit mind blowing. It is mind blowing actually. I, someone said that to me. I've, I'm not sure how true it is, but it did make me think twice about it. I thought, you know what? If I want to go and do that, I don't want to have it static, static ropes and working it and projecting it and getting in other people's way. I'd probably rather just go out there and try and do it in like an alpine style like really quick so i think the main goal of our, of our trip to triangle will be to go and pick up a new route yeah. um and uh so i think go and find a face or a, a feature that hasn't been climbed before and go and try and put up a up a really classic like world-class climb that'd be awesome man that yeah. sounds really cool and if we have time after we've done that then maybe go and try and blast up eternal flame and give it my best chance at free freeing it in one push yeah ground up yeah ground up just like fairly lightweight just have enough to like you know couple one night or two nights max you know and then just get down how do you um because you've spent quite a lot of time on walls like sleeping on them how how long does it take you to adjust to like vertical life yeah like okay i'm i'm sleeping on a wall for a week or yeah i think the first time you do it it feels weird like certain things like you're sleeping in a on a portal ledge isn't the most comfortable all the time depends on your portal ledge as well and um, sleeping with another person so close to you obviously doing the toilet up there can be like a little bit like funny the first time you do it getting used to somebody who's literally like a meter away from you as you're doing your poo uh, you know yeah, and yeah. into a bottle or whatever but um but you eventually kind of get used to it and uh, as for like being up there it's actually you, you acclimatize very quickly if you're climbing from the bottom up you you climb up you know the exposure hit, hits you pretty rapidly after the first pitch you're 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 above the ground yeah. and as you get higher you get further and further away and the ex- but the exposure is you're already getting gradually used to the exposure and accustomed to where you are because you're going up because <clears throat> you're going up and, yeah. and you're you're there all the time and of course like after a whole day of hanging in your harness and your feet dangling with hundreds of meters below you uh, of nothing but air that does 
creep in over time and as you get tired towards the end of the day you do start to feel it a bit but as soon as you get onto a ledge it's almost like a massive weight's been lifted off you at least for me it is and you're just like oh i can chill out now so in the evening you kind of reset you have a cup of tea you have your dinner you read a book you know you may watch some like netflix on your phone with your mate you know something like that and then you and you wake up in the morning you go to sleep and then you wake up in the morning fully refreshed ready to do the battle again uh, and so like that kind of routine is typically what I expect when I go on big walls. What I find more challenging is if I'm approaching a climb from the top down. So yeah. I'm, say I'm like, I, I go to the top via like a walker's route and I abseil into the climb, the exposure hits you straight away. There's yeah. no chance for it to gradually build up. It's straight away abseiling off the top of El Capitan into a 900 meter drop where literally if you went off the end of your rope at the top of the cliff, you wouldn't hit anything until, you know, you probably hit the bottom slabs. It's like of long enough to probably get bored of falling. Probably, yeah. Like, you definitely be falling. Like this is dull. Yeah, you'd be <laughs> like, oh my God, I am falling. And the ground is getting closer and closer. Shit. And that's probably the last part. <laughs> Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Boom. Have you ever been <clears throat> tempted by like all the videos of people like abbing off the end of ropes on our cap? You know, the oh, big yeah, rope doing swings. A big swing. Has that ever tempted you or yeah. have you ever done it? I mean, it or? It's, it's, it's something that, yeah, it's something I would do. If, if somebody had set it all up and I was there, then I'd do it. Yeah. But it's not something I'm going to go seek out just for the sake of doing it. I think, like, again, it comes back to that, like, whole adrenaline junkie thing. Like, I'm not an adrenaline junkie. I'm not, I, I mean, like, I quite like doing those big swings. And if this, if, if I'm, if I'm in that situation and I had to take a big swing, it's fun. But I'm not going to go and seek it out necessarily. Um, like, bungee jumping, I'm, I'm not that bothered about, you know, uh, jumping up airplanes or bungee jumping or, or base jumping. I'm just not that bothered by it. Um, I'm more interested in the actual climbing itself, the challenge the climbing provides, um, you know, the movement on the wall and overcoming uh, overcoming obstacles and, and that sort of side of things. I have yeah. friends who are big into base jumping, who, who love the idea of climbing something and then flying out. And although the idea is really nice and I, if I could just click my fingers, have the skill set and be like, cool, we'll do it. The problem I face is that you have to put so much time and energy and expense to get yourself to that level. And pff, quite frankly, I can't be bothered. You can't, yeah, you, you can't <laughs> really like, just have a go at base jumping. No, you can't. Because Dean Potter did a lot yeah. of the free basing, didn't he, where you take a parachute up and... Yeah. But then it has to be super <clears throat> overhanging. Yeah. The wind has to be right. Yeah. This has to be right. And then it's like... It's balancing too many things. Like, what if it's all right when you set off and you're soloing a route and then it changes the wind picks up and you're like oh no i'm actually so like there's no parachute yeah. anymore like it's just gonna it seems a bit bit wild but it is it's just it's just another branch of climbing another th way for people to enjoy it and if if you're that way inclined then yeah all power to you go and do that but for me i think i'm just too much infatuated by the climbing itself and uh you know, if there's other aspects to climbing that I really enjoy, I actually really enjoy on my rest days, just wandering around boulders or wandering around cliff faces or walking up to things that I think look cool and yeah. checking them out, you know, throwing a rope down them and seeing, does, would this go? I mean, like last week when I was in the sky, I had an absolute blast just doing that. I literally did one climb on lead in a whole week of climbing and the rest of the time, I spent like dangling off ropes looking to see if there was a potential line there and I discovered so many different things that I'm actually like super psyched to get back there just as soon as possible to, to go and go and do them awesome man well we'll um <clears throat> we'll sort of slowly wrap it up that's good cool. um what's so you're I don't want to say professional youtuber but you're on youtube yeah a lot what's how do you think that's affected you as a climber or has it affected you as a climber like where do you think that's influenced you personally i think like uh you know we've got the U i've got the youtube channel now i've always had a youtube channel but <clears throat> in the past it was like you know maybe like put one or two videos up a year um <laughs> so it wasn't like there wasn't much yeah. there um they were popular videos and i put a lot of time in editing them but it wasn't as professional as it is now um the last year and a bit 
I had been working with a filmmaker, Cullen O'Brien, who had been like producing all the, the videos. Um, now it's just me again, but it had, but because it's been so much more professional and there's been a definitely more purpose put into the YouTube channel, it has changed uh, the way I approach climbing and the way I think about things. <clears throat> from Mainly from like a, the thing is like, it's like a content provision, uh, you yeah. know, creating these videos. So, you know, we're gonna go and climb this. I'm gonna climb it for myself, but I don't, I can't just go and climb it. I now have to think, where is the camera going? I have to set up that camera. Okay, we're gonna need another angle. So we're probably, maybe I'll have to put it over there. Okay, actually, it'd be nice to have like another angle from the face. So I need to either hire or find a friend who can hold a camera, <laughs> you know, like- and Who's happy and, hanging off a rope. Who's happy and... hanging off a rope, exactly. Um, maybe I want a drone. Do I have any friends who can fly a drone or will this, you know, and you know, all these things now have to be put into it or will I need to climb the route again to be able to get new angles, which is, I mean, some climbing most things again is okay but climbing some things again is just not on and i don't really want to do it so yeah i would can't you do, do it would you do like second takes on a top rope or do you think no because you, you can't really do that because you can't edit out a rope yeah um so you, you just have to do everything on lead i've done a few i mean to be honest i've never had to do many second takes for angles maybe like a couple of times um but uh, I had to do it once quite fairly recently when my friend forgot to forgot to push the record button. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> Just as I was topping out, and uh, he went, "Oh my god, I can't believe it! Oh, you're gonna have to, uh, I didn't push record." And he, I was like, "Don't worry, I'll just down climb and do it again." And he was like, "Oh, you you happy doing that?" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, it's totally fine." And it was a quite safe climb, so it was all good. But uh, it was pretty funny. And then when I topped out, I had to like fake it a little bit and be like. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> I've just done it. It was so funny. What's um? So Trango is that your next big trip? Have you yeah. got anything lined up beforehand? What's um, next? <clears throat> so so Trang- what's coming up? Trango's next summer. So I think like, as I you know towards tw- you know start of next year, I'm probably going to be thinking like, how am I? How do I build myself up towards that? potentially doing a Yosemite trip maybe in like the springtime just to get myself like climbing smoothly on granite because from a training perspective there's not a lot in Scotland that's going to like prepare me physically and technically for that type of climbing so I, I I'm, I'm contemplating doing a trip to Yosemite just to get myself ready before then I've got a, a hard project thing from last year up in the north of Scotland near Inverness uh, that is probably going to be the hardest climb I've ever done uh, in terms of like pure movement. Yeah, it's quite <clears throat> yeah, it's like a hard physical climb. It's also quite bold. Um, it's going to be E10. You know, in trad climbing, there's only E11 above that, so it's going to be definitely that's like, really cool. Man. One of the hardest trad climbs in the UK, I think. So I'm I'm pretty psyched about that, but I need to put a lot of time into training for that. So I, I've kind of got actually I've, I've approached like a, a coach. Uh, I've got a new training program, kind of like, you know, sort of training me for this thing. I've literally just had my first session in the new training program yesterday. So uh, I'm hoping that with a bit of new training um, and the right mentality and the right focus that I'll get that route done this year. That's Fingers really crossed. cool. <clears throat> I hope so. Um, yeah, so we're a little over an hour, but yeah, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. No worries, dude. Let me hijack your beautiful house. That's and. A- absolutely fine take over the garden that's cool um, it's a great day for it yeah there might be the odd bit of wind or dogs or anything like that but I'd rather be sat in the sun yeah then. same <laughs> um, is there anyone you want to shout out thank anything like that sponsors yeah. like I don't really care shout whoever you want out. not really just, I mean if, if you guys liked what you hear and want to watch some good videos go over to my YouTube channel you just literally type Robbie Phillips into YouTube yeah, and it'll pop I'll up I'll put the link in the description and yeah. your Instagram stuff I'll put all that in the what do you call it video description as well yeah we've got some good good videos coming out pretty soon I've literally finished editing the Orkney video so that'll be good and I've got some great ones from Sky coming up so yeah it's pl- and it's loads of backlog stuff that's just really awesome so yeah really I think it. this video will be up <coughs> as we're filming next Friday yeah Um. so yeah you should have some awesome content to have a look at on your channel as well um 
again thank you for listening or watching the dan hipkiss podcast like comment subscribe ring a bell do whatever you need to do um yeah thank you again man it's been a pleasure boom boom